Hello, filthy perverts. It is I, the one who gripes with the intensity of a plague. I'm currently working on another animation, but in the meantime, there's always time for undermining my value as a human being. To that end, lately I've been hanging around zone streams. To my amazement, Bacarto, which apparently is some sort of deviant site for sinners, sometimes actually loads video for me to watch on my ISP made up of messenger birds and tin cans with strings attached to them, unlike Twitch. Zone is a talented guy-girl thing, so for me it's more of a technical experience. Although judging from the chat denizens, you wouldn't think it. In the course of asking him how he masks layers and his process of keyframing and other boring things, I made an ill-fated promise to draw one of his, her, favorite characters. Some girl named Kylie Griffith from some horrendous Ghostbusters cartoon. Don't judge him. I've also lately been playing a lot with binary layers and Psy, which basically just creates alias lines and color. That works pretty well for cartoons. I also thought I'd take this video to focus more on how to follow an existing model from another art style. You know, so people can complain about it being off-model or too on-model and so on. Lots of fun to be had for sure, so let's get to drawing suspicious images, shall we? Thanks, scripted me. I always like going from script directly into livecom, because it ensures that the quality goes down as quickly as possible. Okay. This is Kylie from Extreme Ghostbusters. I don't know what exactly makes them extreme, but I guess it's the jagged hair. That's probably what it is. Okay, now, we're going to try to... I'm not going to completely emulate this style. But I wanted to make sure that I was on as on model as possible to make tribute to Zone, since he, she is so obsessed with making things as on model as possible. All right, now, a few things to go over before we begin, I guess. There's a few different variations of her model. Let's see, these are the original model sheets. Uh, model sheets are always made very early on in development to try to give an idea of what exactly the art style is going to be, and uh, whenever they're, like, their keyframers are doing work, whenever they're creating timelines and so on, uh, they have a reference to look at that way that they can know, oh, this is what he or she is supposed to look like. So this is the very, the earliest uh, design of her. And then we go on a little bit further to, say, the actual animated series. I think this is the only cell that I have. No, there's a couple more. There's this one I have that I just plucked out of Google Images. And I asked Zone, and he said that this is his favorite one right here. And I asked, why is it your favorite one? And he, she, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to call him he. Uh, and he said that the reason why it was his favorite is because she was seducing someone in this scene. Yes, how predictable. How very predictable, Zone-sama. Ten. Sama Sen. And I think he said that this is his favorite outfit. Yeah. Unitard. Kind of predictable. Kind of predictable. So there's that. Those are the animation cells. And over here, what do you see the side? These are IDW's uh, comic images. I don't know how old the comic is, but IDW has uh, released an Extreme Ghostbusters uh, comic run. And the artist always gives her these big duck lips for some reason. Always had, like, this is one of the few ones where she doesn't do this, and this is the reason why I found and put this one in. But the lips on, on these always go way after here. Just fucking crazy. Don't believe me? Look at this shit. Yeah, this is stuff. Zone said that she's always kissing an invisible ghost penis, which I kind of. Yeah, I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Let's turn that off. That offends me for various reasons I won't go into. Alright. Now, uh, let's start at the beginning, I guess, and let's start to try to identify what exactly composes uh, her model in the first place. Because a lot of people do struggle with this, trying to emulate a style exactly, and it is quite difficult. It is quite difficult because all of our stroke techniques are different, and uh, sometimes it's difficult to identify what exactly composes the model in the first place. Like, even in regards to this uh, model sheet right here, you'll see that it's not exactly uniform with itself. For example, uh, I think... Is it this one that I'm looking at? Yeah, I think so. Hold on. One, two, three, four major strands. One, two, three. And this one does go down into a fourth one, but it's way down here at the bottom. So it does like a certain degree of uniformity. Like, for example, over here, one to one. And then this one should split off, but it's kind of just... There's nothing here. It's completely absent. Then you have this one, and then you have this one. Uh, you want to try to keep the, hand, or the hair strands as uniform as possible as well. Same thing with this one. This one splits off like this, and then this one kind of just goes off into nothing like that. Kind of forgivable with model sheets, though. It's not really a big deal or anything. Uh, but whenever you're animating, you 
you try to maintain that so that it's easy for one frame to go into the other one. You don't want one frame to have four and then the other one have five. And then mid, you know, in, in, in the in-betweener has this problem of, well, how do I get this to happen? And they just have to end up drawing this very short one in between two other ones to try to make it make sense, even though it doesn't make any sense at all. And what I just said probably didn't make any sense either, but whatever. I'm explaining it. I'm explaining it. Real good. Real good luck. Okay, in regards to her face, the original model sheet sort of has this kind of uh, almond shape to it a little bit. Kind of goes like this, and even whenever it's stretched out with her expression, it sort of still maintains that general shape. I'm not going to be too accurate right here. Let's turn that off real fast. And here as well, it kind of is the same thing. Although this one, it kind of just goes in just a little bit to insinuate the uh, the bone structure of her face. But it still has this general almond shape with it. If I had to guess, these were... I don't know, these, this was probably drawn a little bit afterwards, if I had to guess. Uh, let's see. And it seems like this one, yeah. This one also had sort of the weird lack of uniformity with the hair strands and stuff going on as well. Okay, but that's that. Uh, one thing other... A few, uh, there's quite a few things to note about her design. Uh, let's see. Her eyebrows, you notice she has these kind of weird funky eyebrows going on. They always furl down into angles, you'll notice. Uh, they kind of do get this little bitty line right here anytime that you need to show off her brow. Like if she's furrowing her brow, then you extend up from this line. You don't make it like a its own individual line and then have the eyebrow extend down here. You always want to make sure that it's uh, intersecting with the other one. And I'm not, not saying that in regards to any design, just as far as this, the way that the lines are drawn with her model, that seems to be the rule. And more importantly, her eyebrows always seem to go further down and intersect with the sort of shape of her nose to try to uh, guide the, the, uh, the eye all the way down. Because, again, as I've said in many videos before, uh, the purpose of lines is usually... It's sometimes to denote light and dark, and other times it's try to give it directionality. That way, uh, everything kind of stays uniform because you can't shade every last uh, bit of an, an image, especially when it's a cartoon. Uh, her eyes have this sort of uh, almond shape as well. This is kind of the play guy. What I call play guy. Because I, always, uh, I tend to always give uh, women these eyes. I don't know why. I, I try to stop myself from doing it sometimes, but I never succeed because I love those eyes. Love those eyes. And uh, on the original model sheet, her uh, her whatever it's called, the uh, eyeshadow, is always a complete black. Although in the actual cartoon, you'll notice they didn't do that. And even the original cartoon doesn't have quite those same eyes. Instead, it kind of does this, whereas on the model sheet, it did this. Like, there's a kind of another little extra line in here. So we're going to have to try to decide which one of those that we're going to end up wanting. And in the IDW, it kind of does this as well. So that kind of follows more in line with that. But since uh, I'm going to try to follow more or less Zone's little favorite cell here. So this is the one that I'm mainly going to be referencing. Uh, her eyes here kind of do this number. So they're, it's kind of a mix, anyway, in a, in a way. Like, it's not complete. Hold on. It's not going completely into this complete diamond sort of look. And it's not going completely into this straight line on the side look. Instead, it follows it very closely. And it kind of gets a little bit of both. It looks a little bit more like the IDWI, except it's more slanted this way. Like, it's a little bit pulled over to the side, it looks like. And her nose, of course. Let's go over her nose real fast. Nose always has this one individual line that comes down into this button sort of nose that has this one individual shape. Like, this shape is the button of her nose. This is always present on every single one of them. And it always has this one line that comes down, and then it also comes off into an L, this little L-shaped line right here. And that's her nose. So anytime that you draw a nose, you need to follow those lines. If you're staying on model, this is what you're wanting to do. All you're doing is just trying to imitate the uh, 
the way that the lines, you know, move with one another as far as the model goes. The eyebrows on this uh, cell specifically are a little bit unique. On IDW, they completely lose a lot of this. Like with the original model sheets, obviously, they kind of... Everything is uh, sort of this sharp one angle. Like, you come down with one line, then you come across to another line. Uh, the original cell, like for this one example, there's actually multiple lines. A little bit more leadway. This one has three individual um, joints that you have to worry about, which I might use or might not use. But either way, it's far enough over to the side of our head that you don't really notice it much anyways. So this is really what you really want to concentrate on in regards to staying on model with her eyebrows. And, of course, her eyes I haven't really gone too much over this. As I said before, the mascara is not completely black in any of the original cells. IDW uh, follows this a little bit better. Or, it follows the original more so, I should say. Not better, uh, necessarily. Um, but, in regards to her eyes, there's always, across all of her models, sort of this little drop-down right here. Like that. I don't even know what to call that exactly. It kind of looks like a razor blade or something. Or a little bitty ribbon. Let's say that. It kind of looks like a little bitty ribbon that's on the, the, the side of her uh, eyes. And it falls off, it tapers off into a, a, a thicker line that goes down into a thin line. And that's the way that you always want to draw the underside of her eyes. And in regards to her uppers, her upper eyelids, kind of the same general idea. Uh, this one, let's, let's get rid of that one real fast. Let's turn on this one. Move you up real fast. Uh, let's see. This one's a little bit clearer to see. But it looks like it always follows up into that. Let's draw it a few times just to try to get a rough idea of it. And does it do the same thing with this one? It's kind of hard to tell with this one. But it looks like whatever this is called. Like, if you feel your own eye, like you go up to your eyelid, and you know where your skull starts and it rolls back, you you have like the socket of your eye. Uh, that sort of little fold of skin, that sort of individual little line right there, seems to be the upper extent of uh, where the uh, upper mascara eye eyelash seems to end with her model. And that almost, that gives a little bit more ex uh, expressiveness. Because you're, it's, in a way, you're getting like a second eyebrow. Anytime that you're given the ability to use a line in order to give more expressivity, if that's even a word, it's probably not, then use it. Let's fucking use it. Okay. Uh, let's see. Make sure you're back on top. And her mouth real fast. Again, IDW mouths are fucking nuts! Absolutely nuts! The original cell mouths, on the other hand, let's move you over to the side real fast. They always completely draw the outline of the mouth. Which I'm probably going to struggle with because I absolutely hate that. I, I was, you probably know if you watched any of these videos. I hate drawing the full line on the uh, lips. Drives me crazy because it makes it look like she has like clown lips. But it's going to work a little bit better whenever it's... It, because with her, she's so pale in the first place that... In a way, you kind of need that. It's it's probably going to work out in the end. But it's something I generally try to avoid. Uh, but this is the general rule with her. Anytime that you're drawing expression... Like, for example, if she didn't have these big lips in the first place... Then, like, this would be her... Uh, this would be a mouth. It's a little bit much. She looks more angry, this one. So I'd probably furrow down a little bit. So let's say that you give her... That makes her makes her look so much cuter whenever you do it this way. That's the reason why I don't, really don't like the big lips thing. Because having no lipstick or very thin lipstick makes them look cuter to me for some reason. I don't know. Anyways, whatever. That's the general idea. Whenever you get your expression down, follow the line, but then add your uh, lip right on top of it. And that should resolve most of everything in regards to that. So that's one additional step with the uh, the model that we're going to worry about. The only thing, and mostly it's going to be the head that we're going to be worrying about as far as staying on model goes, because that's the thing that most people are going to be focusing on in the first place. 
Body, however, is another uh, thing that we're going to have to worry about. And uh, let's take this off real fast. Uh, where's his creepy fit? Yeah, there we go. Nice and creepy. And let's see. Where's the dress? Yeah, okay. All right, let's pull that over to the side real fast. In regards to her actual body type, she's not a stick, but she is obviously very short. Uh, kind of a long, not, not, not too much. In the original cell, she doesn't really have that long of a neck, and the IDW she does. I'll probably end up using more of this, probably. Um, her tor torso kind of tapers off right here. Kind of a high rib cage in regards to her model. Uh, it's kind of the same with this one, like her rib cage would kind of in there. Uh, the ratio of her torso to waist, just sort of the hips area, is sort of like that, and it's kind of going to stay the same. So anytime that you're going to be drawing her body, you're going to try to keep that in mind. And that, in, that can be sort of the most difficult uh, part of it. If you're drawing like a full, if you're drawing the, the whole body, I imagine a lot of people are going to struggle with that, because a lot of people have their own body type that they always draw. Like, every single time. And it's a real struggle for them to get out of drawing it that specific way. Uh, so if you're trying to stay on model, I guess the easiest way to do it is just to try to remember the proportions. Just try to draw off where the rib cage is, sort of the, uh, the center of the chest, the clavicle. Just keep those lines in mind. The center line, bring that center line down. Uh, find the sides of the body. And just keep squaring off the individual areas so that you can get everything situated exactly where you want it to be. And where exactly... Say the belly button is probably usually a good place to also put that secondary line. So here we have the sort of ratio that we're looking at. I'm not going to give math to this or anything. But we have like the, the clavicle, the um, center of the chest, and then the um, rib cage, And then the belly button, and then we come down and then we have like where it furrows off by the legs. And let's say right here, that'd be another good place. Kind of right where the uh, the I don't get, the upper thigh meets the waist would probably be a good place to also put that secondary line. So that's the ratio that we're going to be looking at. And it will take a while for you to get used to drawing it this way, or it'll get you. It'll take a while for you to get used to uh, recognizing the way that these proportions sort of work out. But, and that would be sort of belly button as well right here. Now come down. We can't really see everything here. But it would probably end right here, which means that are right there. And that's the general proportions that she's going to have in regards to her overall model. And IDW stays pretty true to the original, I think. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Just keep all these things in mind. And it's going to take a, a, a while of practicing and going over layers over and over again to get it right exactly. The Probably the most important part of her design is probably going to be the hair, though. And that's something that's going to be a bit of a bitch. In IDW, I think she never actually has long hair that I've seen anyways. It always comes off to, to these little bangs right here. And I kind of like that. It's it, That's kind of cute. And she kind of has a little ponytail thing going on. But I'm going to try to stay more or less true to the... Uh, the long hair design. I, I was considering the idea of actually giving her a sort of little ponytail in the back. Let's try to fuse those two together real fast. Let's count the number of strands that we have going on here. She kind of has that Imoya hair in a way. Imoya. Imoya. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, well, power to you. And I love these little things right here. Anytime that you draw a character, often you're going to have like uh, the front side of the hair where the bangs are. And then you have the back side of the hair, and the, you know, left and right. And in the middle, you're always going to have this one individual tiny little strand that sort of just pokes up and says, Hello! Hello! I'm the little mini strand. And this, it's useful to have this because it, it's hard to explain why, but it really helps with intersecting both sides of the hair and showing where exactly everything kind of furrows into. And especially if you're doing animations and uh, you're going from frame to frame, then sometimes it can be useful to have that one little thing there. Because it keeps the ooh, it keeps the uh, two lines from intersecting too cleanly right here. That I'm probably going a li little bit too deep right there. So just ignore what I said just then. Ignore what I said. Okay. Anyways, in regards to her hairstyle, 
Uh, IDW sort of places one individual big bang right in the middle of a forehead. Uh, the original sort of has these two individual ones that come off to the side. Both of these have this one little strand that comes off right down here. And you can't really, see, since this is a total black, you can't see it right here, but it's right over there as well. And uh, the bangs on this one come completely down and taper off into the sort of side locks that she has. Oop, come on. Trying to be fast and accurate at the same time, which isn't working too well. And let's count our strands again. Guys, one, two, three. And then it comes off to the fourth one at the very bottom. Uh, this one, one, two. And there's barely just a third one at the very the bottom of that one. Okay, so a good way of trying to combine this. Let's try to draw this on top of that real fast. Uh, start with the top one. Then we'll go over to the second one. Then we'll, of course, this is very messy, of course. And then we'll come down to the third one. And then finally the fourth one. So, and let's come back up. Should I, let's try to split this off a little bit to give ourselves some breathing room. It is kind of nice for her to have this extra bit of forehead right here. I don't know, to me it gives her a little bit more expressivity. So I might end up retaining this. Or I could end up coming a little bit more down like that. I don't know. I'll figure it out eventually. I'll just keep drawing uh, primaries until I figure out exactly what it is that I want. And in regards to this, this is going to be the problem child right here, deciding what we're going to do in regards to her ponytail. I don't think I want a ponytail. Let's try to see if we can combine the two. Take a lesson from my fusion videos. And come down right here. And... Da, 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 da. Just a little bit, and let's go too overboard. If we pull this back, actually, what we can do is just give a little bit of... Sort of ponytail. I, I love it whenever girls do this. If they actually have enough hair to pull it off. Of course, I feel sorry for girls that actually have this much hair. Because I know how much of a... I used to have a big mop head. Whenever I was younger. So I know the problems of actually having too much hair. It was actually painful to comb through. It was so thick. But college took care of that. College took care of that. It sure did. Uh, but we can do this. Actually, I'm getting a little bit too my too much of my own style on that one right there. Because this is kind of similar to how I usually draw in some ways. And let's try that. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to do this one to this one. And this to this. Okay. And it can look sort of like that. And that might be a good way of actually trying to combine the, the two hairstyles together. And I don't think I'm going to use IDW's... Uh, like, the IDW has this very jagged side of the face. Whereas in the original model, model seat, a sheet, remember, it was a very almond shape face. And the animation cell is probably a little bit more rigid in some ways. What was Zone's creepy favorite one? Come on, Zone's creepy purple one. Where are you? Right here? No? This? Oh, yeah, I'm looking at the other one. Okay. Uh, where the hell did I put it? Oh, face. <laughs> it's right under it. Sorry. Okay, but in regards to this one, let's see. This one, it is it is present, but this is pretty on model with the original model sheet. But it does have enough curvature for it to not be overly round and not enough uh, jaggedness to make it overly uh, angular. So that's what we're going to be looking at in regards to staying on model. Trying to make it as close to the original as possible. It will not ever be completely perfect unless you are... Just working in an animation studio and just rigidly uh, focusing on ensuring that it is always, you know, picture perfect. Like you're drawing, you know, five frames of animation every day over the process of several weeks in order to create, like, four seconds of animation or something. Then, yeah, sure, you can be as on model as you, as you please. But for me, I'm going to just try to get it as close as I possibly can while incorporating a little bit of myself into it in the process. And a little bit, a bit of zone as well, I'm sure. I'm sure he wants to, to be a little bit of part of Kylie as well. Alright, so that's what we're looking at in regards to that. Now I'm going to skip into the primary stages of actually getting a pose down, which I'm not going to describe in livecom. So I'll hand that off to you, future Eli. You and your fucking ant wars. Alright, I will see you guys after he's done. Bye.
Oh, all right. It's time for some post-commentary. And I have like an hour of this scheduled ahead of me looking at this timeline. This is going to be absolutely miserable. Guy, uh, jo Z actually, Zone Stream is on right next to my monitor here. And I told him to draw something distracting so that it messes up my commentary. So we'll see what he has to offer. Earlier, he's done with this by now. But earlier, he was drawing a caterpillar ejaculating blood, which was highly concerning. But he, he thankfully got over that. Uh, right now, he seems to be drawing Pearl from Steven Universe. This is... Yeah, this is probably not going to end particularly well. But anyways, as far as this, uh, the commentary goes, right here I'm just going through trying to figure out what exactly I want as far as posing goes. Oh, this one is... It's always a problem trying to get through and figure out what exactly I want as far as this goes. Because as I keep going over every single art gripe, I really want something that's somewhat dynamic. But at the same time, i found whenever I'm doing... I, I've told people in the past, don't be afraid to make mistakes and things like that. Uh, that's one of the key things that I keep trying to uh, tell people, but each time that I'm doing these art grapes, since I know, well, I'm being recorded, and at the same time, I can't spend too much time, or else the commentary is going to run long, like it did this time, then I end up deciding, you know what, I can't really be too aggressive with the, uh, with uh, trying to make the... Uh, style overly elaborate, so I end up kind of just going with what's safe. Which is one of my little faults, I guess. Uh, but I, I did spend quite a lot of time trying to get... What is he saying? Pearl emerging from Spooge Mountain isn't distracting. I need to step up my game. Yes, Zone. Just, you know, try harder. Try harder. But I do uh, go through quite a few of these. And I'm sure that you're going to see one or two of these things. are like, oh, how come you didn't use this one? I hate the final result. Too bad! Too bad! Too bad, so sad. I ended up going to something completely different from all these things. But I th did feel it was pretty important to actually show off as many of these as possible. Just to show what exactly the work process is like. Uh, lots of people draw in different ways. Some people draw with a completely, uh... Like, one stroke, one primary sort of method. Where they go in and just try to make perfect strokes as lightly as possible. And, like, say, work over a gray layer or something in order to try to maintain a, a proper scaling tonality throughout the entire image. That way they're working up the entire time versus what I do. Which is just working, can, kind of, I don't know, just working across many different layers, working down consistently. To the point where I end up with something that I feel is more finalized. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm doing with this one. I kind of like the idea of this pose. But the more that I worked on it, the more I decided, you know what, it's, I don't know, it's it's just too simple in some ways. And also, I didn't really like the way that I was having to pose her face and so on. Uh, since this is going to be sort of an overly, like usually in my, my uh, art right videos, I'm always talking about the fact that I'm really overly concerned about over-sexualizing the images. But in this case, since we're doing something for Zone, it's a little bit appropriate, so... It's important to get a little bit sexy in here. Why not? Why not? And uh, I also liked this one. I kind of got down to these two and was trying to choose between them. And I think I end up completely starting over uh, the next day after I'm through doing this. And I just keep going back over them and redrawing them over and over again. Not necessarily because, you know, they're not something that I could use as a primary. But because I could not really get a good enough feel for them. And I just kept going back over it over and over and over again and saying, does this feel right? Does this feel right? And it never really, it never really clicked with me. And I'm sure to some people, you know, like if this that I'm drawing here will probably end up looking fine to quite a few people. And they'll say, how come you didn't use this? But it just never really clicked with me. And that probably more than anything else is probably what's going to be limiting you as far as if you're a young artist. Don't be too concerned about whether or not something is looking good or, you know, you feel like it's going to be received well. Be more concerned about whether or not it is appealing to you. Because what's most important as far as, uh, of course, obviously this is not going to be true if you're doing commissions and stuff like that. But as far as young artists go, you really need to be more concerned with starting out. With making sure that you're, you're actually enjoying what you're doing. And if you aren't enjoying drawing, then there's really not much point in drawing, is there? Uh, one of the most, that's probably the biggest hurdle you're going to have to overcome is just trying to figure out how exactly you can always enjoy what you do. 
Uh, because too many people are like, I need to learn to draw. And they'll sit down and like, I'll try to draw this exact image of this tree outside. That seems like a good project. But then you ask them, you know, do you really want to draw a tree? And here's where I start over. And they'll say, no, not really. <laughs> then why are you drawing it? You know, if you want to draw, you know, silly fan art of Pearl from Steven Universe being covered in sperm from tentacles. I don't know how that's related, but if you, if you want to draw that, you know, go ahead and draw that. You know, as long as you're getting practice in. Uh, with Like with me, I got started, as I've said before, with just dumb little reaction images faces. I thought it was funny to draw people making these dumb little faces, so I just kept doing that. And that's just how I got better over time. I do kind of like this little pose. She seems cute doing this little thing. And I came up with the idea of maybe she's leaning over a little bit more, so I went back over it and kind of redrew it this way. And usually I will kind of start with these little simple shape things. But also, with this one, it's the pose itself was a little bit too congested, and I ended up feeling like it wasn't really showing off quite what I wanted. Uh, with Kylie, I really don't know much about her personality, other than just looking at her images and seeing like a couple of clips or something. So I kind of just have a loose idea, but I think that she does kind of convey what her personality is pretty well through the images that I found of her, at least. So I wasn't overly concerned about that. So usually that's what you're going to want to do. The pose needs to convey what the characterization happens to be, but in this case, I, it was more of a matter of trying, you know, just trying to be a little bit more aggressive with my uh, posing and just trying to show off as many things as possible. Uh, as far as exactly how you should sort of orient your poses, how you should, you know, do this sort of thing. Just, you know, don't worry too much about whether it looks good or not, because you can do a million of these things and it's not going to matter. Like, you can see how many I've done already. Uh, I mean, it did take me a few hours to get through all these. But that's really not a big deal, because I was still enjoying myself in the process. And <laughs> this one's a very plague pose, just because of those big hips. I love drawing the, I don't know, maybe that's just one of my things. I like drawing those... Not overly large. There are some people that have, like, this big fetish for extremely large posteriors. I bet you've never encountered those online. No. And, uh, they always draw... Some, some people draw these, like, grotesquely inhuman-looking butts that are just, like, five times the volume of the rest of the entire body. And at that point, I'm like, it's not even sexy anymore. It just looks ridiculous. It just looks like something is medically wrong with them. Why are you even doing this? But some people like doing that. So if you like doing that, drawing medically unsound buttocks, I mean, go right ahead. Go right ahead. It doesn't really matter. I'm sure Kylie is very familiar with medically unsound buttocks. And here I decide maybe I should go with something a bit more two-dimensional, a bit more flat, uh, because I've been focusing so much on the idea of it being as uh, posed, I guess, as possible, dynamic as possible. End up tiring out of it. And here I am just going through all of them and saying, oh, what do I want to do? What do I want to do? What ideas do I have? And there's plenty of things that I could do. What I really wanted to avoid doing was making it too, too action-oriented to the point that it's like zooming in. Like, for example, the, the one earlier where she's sort of, her foot is in the forefront of the image. And uh, most of the rest of it is in the back because of, you know, just how it's fading into the background. And here's the beginning of, uh, here is the beginning, the, uh, genesis of the, uh, final image. And, uh, what the hell was I just saying? I got distracted by the fact that we finally arrived at this point. Um, I don't know. I'll have to backtrack and figure out what the hell it was I was saying. But yeah, this is the genesis of the final image that we ended up getting to. I, um... Uh, you just have to keep drawing until it evolves into something else, is basically what I was getting at. Uh, with this one, uh, I I kind of, like I was trying to imitate the lying on the couch pose. Oh, that's what I was, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was uh, trying to talk about the, the foreshortening that was going on. And with that one specifically, like the foot was way up in the foreground and everything else was so much in the background. It was a nice pose. But so much detail was on the foot, it's like the, the image is not supposed to be about the, the fucking foot. Now, who cares about the foot? I'm Well, I take that back. Lots of people would be enamored with a foot-centered image. Uh, but we we don't talk about that, those kind of people. 
but uh it, it you can draw an image that looks very dynamic and very action oriented but at the same time focuses so much on one particular detail or it zooms in on like a piece of equipment like i could show her like in a posture of trying to catch a ghost or something and it like because of the way that the uh layout is then it could end up zooming in really closely on like the gun or something that she's holding and if that's all that you're looking at, sure, it's an interesting image. It would make a good wallpaper, but you're not really seeing her. So whenever I was drawing this, I'm kind of more concerned about I need to show her face, like, first of all. Uh, that's why a lot of them, her face is kind of resting up in the forefront and everything else is being pushed into the background. And that's one of the struggles of having to do these little art great videos is that you do, wanna, you do want to kind of focus on the face because that's where most of your personality is going to come from. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, you're kind of struggling to inject this, uh, sort of action pose in with it at the same time. Make everything look a bit more dynamic, a bit more interesting than someone just standing still in frame. And that's the reason why I kind of ended up with this. I started out with the idea of her reclining on a couch, which I really didn't like. I really hate drawing couches. I don't know what it is about it. I hate drawing couches. Uh, this, it's, a, it's a couch. They're boring. They're boring. Dumb old couches. Nasty old couches. Who uses a couch anyways these days? I haven't watched TV in forever. Anytime I watch TV, I'm always a mate. Like, a commercial comes on. And I think, a, a commercial? Like, I haven't seen one of these in years. And they're so strange because they're, they're always marketed to a type of a person that I don't interact with anymore. <laughs> like, a, this, no, just... I don't know, it's, it's just so bizarre to me. The, like, awkward white people advertising cell phones and dancing in silly outfits. It's like, what the fuck am I looking at? It doesn't make any sense to me anymore. It's like looking at a completely different culture. I just, it's mind-boggling. Anyways, who sits on couches? Couches suck. Anyways, I finally eventually get... To the point where I decide, you know what, this kind of makes this sense. Uh, as I'm doing the layout, like we started with the dumb couch thing, and I eventually decided, well, maybe she can have been collapsed against the ground or something, because it's a post-action pose. And that's where the genesis of this idea of her uh, having fallen down after capturing a ghost came from, and I ended up running with that. And it, it, in this one, since I'm kind of trying to draw her for the very first time, a lot of this is going to be more me trying to focus on her model versus something like personality or layout or posing or something like that. So that's more what I wanted to focus on. So to that end, I started... How many poses have we gone through? We started on a generic one that we worked off of, uh, the couch one. Then we went into a secondary one that sort of started with this one. I don't think it's the purple one. There was one before that. So one, two, three is the, the purple one. And this is the fourth primary that we have done um, with this unique pose. And the fifth time that I go over this specific uh, pose will be the, uh, the final line art. So a lot of time dedicated to trying to get the kind of uh, the shapes and everything down as accurately as possible. Uh, trying to get the lines and her general model down as uh, accurately as possible. Very, very time-consuming. I think the total time of this thing was like... I don't know, something ridiculous, like eight hours or nine hours. But then again, I did spend a lot of time sort of watching videos while drawing at the same time. So I probably wasn't moving as rapidly as I can. And at the same time, I was spending so much time playing and trying to figure out new ways of doing things, uh, layout-wise and whatnot, that I ended up spending a lot of time doing that as well. So don't be too... You know, oh, holy shit! Eight hours, I can't do that. I don't blame you, you know, don't worry about it too much. Really, like, this even is fine. Like, using this as final line art would be absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with this. And, uh, as I've said before, I, in a way, I actually like these sort of unfinished uh, piece looks more than I do the actual final line art. Just because, it's, I don't know, they just look a lot more natural to me. As far as, or they look a bit more organic, they look a bit more... I don't know, interesting. I really don't even know how to explain it exactly. But I, f I feel like a lot of people actually feel the exact same way. And that they actually do like the sort of sketched out look of an incomplete image 
more than they do a final beautifully rendered painting or something. Kind of interesting like that. And I'm glad that people feel that way because it really makes it easier to uh, work your way into art in general whenever people aren't constantly demanding that things be as perfect as possible. And here comes the slime, the quote-unquote slime. And that is my ticket to get the hell out of here. What the hell is zone drawing? And now back to me, the important one. I don't know what he was saying, but I can rest assured that it is not important whatsoever. Now, uh, this part, of the, I just wanted to briefly show exactly how the binary thing works. A few things I'm going to have to demonstrate, actually. Okay, first off, we got our primary done for the most part. Still a couple things that I'm not entirely pleased with. Like, for example, the this leg probably needs to be a little bit over here or something like that. But I'll worry about that later on. Uh, as far as binary layers, what we're going to be doing this whole video on. Binary layer uh, is an option in uh, Paint Tool Sci. I'm sure if you're working in Photoshop, there's plenty of ways to uh, filter the image to get uh, an aliased look. But in Sci, this is how you do it, at least in the latest version. I think in older versions, actually, there used to be a tool that was just called... Uh, it's like a binary brush or something like that. And that's how you made lines back then. But you can draw this in any color, and it's going to create it entirely in black. Like, for example, right now, you'll notice my primary, primary swatch is red. So even if I begin drawing in red, it's going to give me black lines, because it's binary. It's only drawing in uh, black and white. What are you doing? Reduce the set. There you go. Okay. <clears throat> but, I'll show this briefly. Uh, I'm not even going to... Why am I doing this? I'm not even going to keep these lines. I don't know, I might keep them if it turns out well enough. But, you know, so the, the nice thing about this, it, it does create a very specific sort of look about it. Which I do like. I always like drawing drawing in uh, alias lines for some reason. I guess because, uh... Like I used to do some... I'll, no, I'll, I'll let future Eli discuss this. Discuss eye scribble and whatnot, because I've done that in the past. But it's always fun working within limitations. Like, you can't just... Uh, shade everything to fix every problem. You actually have to worry about very uh, pixel-specific sort of things. Same thing in regards to sprites and so on. Uh, but one thing I wanted to show with this is that once you were working in binary, you can reduce the opacity down and get back your original color. Uh, I think, what happens if you reduce it all the way down? Okay, yeah. Because of the way that the... whatever it's called, the algorithm, I, I don't know. However it works, it is uh, trying... It is kind of weird that it goes down to yellow. I'm not sure why it's doing that exactly. Huh, that is unusual. But anyways, you can reduce it down and get your original color back, and it's just going to keep reducing the thickness because it's still registering trying to find the, uh, the highest opacity items in the line that you're creating, and then it's turning those into black is what's going on. Okay, but you can do that to quickly change the color of your line, oh, you, you'll notice that it's only, it's not going to give you anything, like any in-between colors. It's just going to give you very basic primaries. Unless you get right in the middle, then it really loses its shit. So don't do that. Don't do that. But that's how you do that. And I'll show this. Uh, if you want it to, if you want more control over it, what you can do is make another layer under it merge it back down into it, and you'll notice it's no longer set to prime uh, to binary, but it still has the same look about it. So make sure that you're done with how you want it to look before you do this. But if you preserve opacity, then you can go back over it and change it to whatever color that you want to. And in, let's see, right there. Let's say that we're, let, let's say that we have some color filled in already. Let's say, right around here, do this real fast. This won't take long to demonstrate. Uh, I'll probably go a little bit more over uh, some minor stroke method things, I guess, but then that'll be it. Let's say that we have some color here. Let's go ahead and change this to something a bit more natural. Uh, I don't know, like a brown or something. Her hair is actually black, but it's going to show up better this way. So we have our brown color, and you notice since we have the line on top of it, it still kind of retains that uh, bin binary look to it. Just make sure that whenever you're painting sort of in this binary, um, keep, of course, your binary uh, lines on top of everything. 
And uh, just make sure that you're working only with one color. In other words, you don't want to start shading it on this specific layer just yet. But let's say that we want to make some shading here on this, but we want it to be in binary. So what you would do is do it just like you would do, do it normally. Of course, we're working in binary. You can turn this off and on if you want. I suggest that whenever you're, you're trying to get a uh, binary look, you actually do draw with the binary option turned on. Because, uh, like for example, I just turned it off and you'll notice there's lots of little pieces that are kind of missing that I didn't see whenever I was uh, uh, working in binary. And it works the other way too. Like say if I wanted to do, by the way, this is totally ectoplasm. The stuff dripping off of her, that's going to be green, it's going to be ectoplasm, and nothing else. Don't you worry about it. Don't you worry about it. But let's say that we're uh, doing this, we're doing some shading, and we kind of try to get a little bit fancy, and we create some blank, blank like, uh, for example, like, whoop, still have the, man, that's old. It's been a long time since I've played with that. It's pretty nice. We'll start. Okay. Really? No? Let's switch to the blending mode. And we give this kind of, uh, you know, that blending look to it, where the opacity is lowered down. Think, oh, that looks nice. So let's switch it over to, to a binary. And suddenly it becomes a big mess. Because obviously whenever you go into binary, it's not going to look exactly the same as it does uh, whenever you are not working in binary. So don't do that. Don't do it. But whenever you're uh, done figuring out what exactly you want your shading to look like, you do the same trick. Merge it down into a normal layer. And then you get your uh, normal control back. And then you can go back and just paint over it with whoop, preserve opacity come on huh that's weird oh sorry I okay yeah I fucked it up where's it this one okay sorry I it was so small that I didn't even notice it was there this one was the uh, the base hair layer that I had turned on okay there we go but you do it just like that so that's how I'm going to be probably handling all of my uh, binary shading solutions in this particular video so whenever you see me flying through at, you know, three frames per second sped up, that's what I'm doing. Okay, but in regards to actual stroke method, I think I went over this for the most part, but I'm going to be copying a little bit of uh, IDW's stroke method style, a little bit, in that I'm going to try to be figuring out exactly how much pressure they put on specific areas and things like that. And it kind of looks like, of course, this is working in much smaller detail. I imagine whenever they, whoever the artist was that drew this, I still haven't checked. <laughs> that whoever did this uh, was drawing at a much reduced size on paper, obviously. So that's the reason why these strokes look the way that they do. But I'm going to try to be getting a little bit of that in. And where's a better image, actually? Guys. This is probably a better image. Um... But you'll notice that there's some line variation thickness that I think I've covered before. So I'm going to try to make sure that it's not clean. In other words, I'm not going to be making, like a lot of, I've mentioned this in the past, but digital artists that have only learned digital will just do this over and over again until they get that perfect line. I will be trying to avoid doing that. And I'll actually be trying to create a little bit enough of a pin pressure to where, where I get some line variation. And get a little bit of wobble in so that it looks like a natural ink line which I could probably also probably do if I fucked around with some of the textures and stuff spread and rush yeah it kind of does the same thing but it's going to take a while to figure out exactly what it is that I want to use it might be something like that getting that spread look about it but it's not going to point being it's not going to be absolutely clean and you know perfect straight lines. So I'm going to try to focus on that. Except for like the eyes or something, for example. Those do need to be as clean as possible because you're going to be looking directly at them. Directly at them. But other than that, I think that's pretty much everything that I need to mention in regards to uh, working in this sort of uh, alias binary focus type drawing. Uh, anything else? Probably not. Uh, I'm going to shade down. Um, just that whenever you are Again, the, kind of the same thing that we have done in prior videos needs to apply here as well. 
uh, try to ensure that you work to separate layers. Um, you don't, as I said, you don't need to place down the base color, like if our hair is black or something, we draw black. And then we don't need to do that to a binary layer. We can do that normal with the raster because the uh, edges are going to be hid by whatever's on top of it, which is going to be a binary layer line. So we don't have to worry about that either. So there's that. And, of course, whenever you do your shading, make sure you contain that to its own layer. And, uh, like, I'm going to be creating folders, and we're going to have, you know, like, the hair line, then the, or the, sorry, the, the hair uh, shading, and then the uh, skin shading, and so on. And uh, that's how I'm going to be handling that. And that's for optimal control, just so that we can adjust the colors to whatever it is that we want to do. All right. But you'll notice that my style obviously very different from IDW style. And of course, as I said before, I was trying to sort of more imitate the original model to some extent. So it's going to look a bit more like Zone's favorite creepy cell that he loves so much. Not quack quack. Not quack quack at all. Okay. And of course, uh, I tried to incorporate his favorite outfit in the world, which kind of just... I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure what's going on with this. I'm not sure what's going on with it, but I made it work. I made it work. And it looks a bit more like her original model to some extent, too. I could probably adjust this a little bit more to get it. And that's probably what I'm going to be doing in this binary layer. I'm probably going to try to... Like, her eyes probably need to be angled a little bit more. She needs to have a sharper sort of countenance than I gave her. So I'll be doing some minor tweaks as far as the uh, actual line work goes. But that's what I'm going to be doing... I will see you guys. Actually, I won't see you guys. I guess they'll leave it for future fuckface, whatever his name is. So you take it away, future fuckface. So long. So long. What a world. And I'm back. I'm back. Let's talk about eye scribble. Yes. I actually didn't mention that. I have completely forgotten about it until I started listening to the uh, the commentary from the, the, the live commentary anyways. Uh, things like I Actually, whiteboarding is what it's called, really. It's not necessarily just eye scribble. There's quite a few of them, uh, sites that are like this. Uh, usually they kind of turn it into sort of a Pictionary game. But uh, sometimes they leave it a bit more open. Some of, some of the whiteboard uh, sites are a bit more open than others as far as letting you do whatever you want to and having no time limits and so on. Some of them are more, are more game-oriented. I used to really enjoy uh, doing that sort of thing. I guess one of the things I like about aliasing... It, the, it does have a kind of distinctive look, and it is pretty interesting. But at the same time, I think what I like more about it is just the fact that it has limitations. With uh, working in raster and being able to paint and do anything, then you're kind of burdened with the knowledge that you have to do that. Like, uh, you have the option of making something as realistic as possible. And even if you're not really that concerned about that sort of thing, it's still there, whereas uh, if you're imposed with limitations like you can only work in black and whites or something like that, then it's a challenge and it becomes something that's accessible and at the same time is, uh, you know, not only accessible, it's fun to try to do because it's like a game that you're working in. And that, I guess that's the reason why I kind of like aliasing. In addition to it also looking kind of neat, uh, here what I'm doing, I'm just desperately trying to get the eyes just right. To me, they don't, you can see me just, it's sped up like 16 times normal speed. And uh, I'm kind of just sitting here looking at them, just staring, trying to figure out what exactly it is that I don't like about them. Because I really did not really care for them that much right here. And I think I ended up finalizing... I had to end up squashing and contracting them over and over again because the angle that they were at was just not quite right. And things like eyes and the mouth... Uh, just expression in general is probably going to be the thing that hangs you up the most. Because getting that, you know, absolutely right is probably the most important thing most of the time. Not always, but a lot of the times. Because, again, that's where the eye is going to lead to, and that's kind of what the, the, uh, that people, the eye is going to be drawn to, and what is most important about the, uh, image, because it's so por uh, personality-oriented. And with her, I wanted to make sure that she didn't really look angry, because I wanted to make sure that she looked kind of approachable, but I didn't really want her to look vulnerable, because that's not really her personality either, so I was trying to get this idea down of she was kind of exasperated, but at the same time relieved, or something like that, and I just kept going over it over and over again until it actually started to work, and I think a lot of that is going to be the eyebrows, 
Because if, if you change the eyebrows to, to more of a furrowed state rather than being elevated like they are, then it would drastically change her expression. Uh, just minor things like that really dramatically alter the overall presentation of the image. Um, let's see. The, the hair, yeah. The hair is very similar to how... <laughs> it's like Saiyan hair in a way. And I think I got a little bit too much of that in there. Her actual on-model hair is not quite as thick as this, I think. It's more... It's kind of stringier in some ways. And I gave a little bit too much volume. Although it's kind of interesting looking. I'm really not going to complain too much about it. Uh, the over, Like I said before, I'm not trying to get perfection as far as her model goes. But I was trying to incorporate some of me in there. At the same time, trying to stay as on-model and as, as I could in the process. And I think it did it pretty well. And uh, the key to that probably is just going back over it over and over again until you finally figure out what it is exactly about her on-model appearance that gives it that appearance. And that's kind of the theme of this overall video. It's just trying to figure out what exactly makes her her, or whatever model that you're working against in the first place. And a lot of the, the times it's just going to be like the proportions of basic shapes and the importance and emphasis placed on lines. Get back up there, pop filter. Stop falling down. Or just fall down on your own. I don't give a shit what you do. So that, that's what you want to look for in regards to uh, uh, models and whatnot. Okay, just fall down. I, I, don't, I don't fucking care. Whatever. Shitty ass pop filter. This thing is not work. I'm not going to go on a rant about that. Just pop filters suck. Pop filters suck. Toes are fun to draw. Yes, they are. But they're also a bit of a pain in the ass. It's very uh, easy to make ugly looking toes. Because, like, take off your... It doesn't matter if you're in a bus. It doesn't matter if you're in a school. Take off your shoes right now. Show your feet to everyone around you. It doesn't matter if it's grandma. Who cares? She's seen them before. Take off your shoes. Look at your feet. And see how ghastly your feet are. Like, this absolutely horrendous looking. Especially the toes. Human beings have big... It's kind of actually small, cruddy little toes. Like, the smallest one kind of looks like it doesn't even belong there. Like it's something that they just glued onto our feet as a joke whenever we were born. Ha <laughs> we were putting toes on everyone where they belong. It really, if you think about it, if you look at our feet, it's just like a big meat club that has these tiny little bitty pegs, flesh pegs, sticking out of it. Really gross looking if you start thinking about it too much. Feet are disgusting, but they're also hot, yeah. So actually getting, getting them drawn correctly is pretty difficult. Something I kind of like, I've seen other people, this sounds really strange and perverted, but I'm going to talk about drawing feet now. <laughs> but something I've actually liked seeing other people do whenever drawing feet, attractive feet even, is uh, making them a bit longer than they should be. And I've tried to do that somewhat, but it's easy for that to get out of control. And this is, of course, once again, this is how you draw a circle in size, since they've never actually fixed it. You just click once with a mouse hit end or whatever the camera swivel thing is to rotate, and then shift and then mouse click again. Just keep doing that until you make an angular circle thing, and then you reduce it and it makes it a little bit more curved. That's how you make a circle, as I've explained before. Uh, but yeah, feet are gross. Feet are amazing. I hate feet. I love feet. And kind of the same thing applies with uh, hands as well. It's very difficult to get good-looking hands. It's pretty easy to dis... Like, most people that are cartoonists or you just draw whatever are not really going to put as much emphasis on hands and feet and stuff as I try to do. And I probably do it way too much. Don't do it as, you know, like I do. Uh, but most of the time they will just give, like, the image, like, big sausage fingers. Like, just really rudimentary hands. Which probably is best... But I think it is kind of important to learn how to draw hands in general and feet. Because even if, as I've said before, even if you're not actually drawing in a realistic style, it's important to know how things hinge and work and things, so that whenever you are working in a reduced style, a more cartoony style or whatever, then you do know exactly how all that works. Belly button is another thing that's kind of hard to draw in some ways. Because you're reducing it at the same time, it needs to be sort of attractive looking, even though belly, belly buttons are another thing that's kind of gross. But at the same time, is Oddly luring, yes. So just be careful around those as well, I guess. I usually like this going to a reduced, like, two-line style, 
or one is kind of just barely curved in and the other one is kind of more of a straight line. And I try to do that, although sometimes it fails. You can't succeed every single time. It, as far as working as an artist, you can't be afraid of failing too much. You should be aware of, you know, I shouldn't do this, I should do this, you know, just basic stuff. But just don't be, you know, don't let yourself be traumatized by the knowledge of, I might mess up. You know, just don't worry about it. Back in high school, people would always get on to me, I think I might have told the story before, of the fact that I just threw away all of my uh, drawings. Like, any time that I would draw something, I would look at it go, eh, that's okay. Then I would crumple it up into a ball and throw it inside of the trash can. And everyone always got really upset with me about that, because how come you don't keep them? How come you don't keep your history? I don't care. You know, it's just... The whole... <laughs> anytime that you draw, be a... You know, this is one of the common things that they teach me in regards to drawing. There's no such thing as a finished drawing. There's only drawings that you stop working on. Uh, everything can always be improved upon. Everything can always be changed. And since there is no sort of right or wrong in regards to... Uh, whether or not an image is correct or not, like it's just a matter of preference, then, you know, obviously it would fall in line with that line of reasoning that there, at no point in history are you ever going to be done with an image. You can always improve upon it. You can always change it to the point that it looks like a completely different kind of style that would necessitate even more changes, and so on. I could work on this from here to eternity, and slowly change it from one kind of style to another, and so on. You know, I could just do all sorts of things. But eventually, you do have to stop. Every single time that you start an image, it is always a process of learning. It's a process of experimentation. And just trying new things, and failing, and having minor successes. And just doing that over and over again until you're satisfied with what you have experienced. And at that point, you stop. And at what point you stop is completely up to you. Like, for example, whenever I was primarying this image, I was thinking about the idea of coming with a background that was also aliased. But at the point that I've actually gotten through the line image here, I had decided, you know what, I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to bother uh, uh, drawing a complete background, because it's really not that important to the overall image. Because the whole point of this image is the alias lines, and trying to show off exactly how I do that. So actually doing the background is just kind of... I mean, I could do it. I could probably make the background look better. But this is more time, and it's really not accomplishing much of anything other than just showing off that I can do it and just completing the image and so on. So, you know, just don't be overly concerned about it. Will people complain about it? Yes, people will always complain about everything that you do. Uh, should I tell that story? Yeah, let's go ahead. By the way, uh, this, this trap, the, apparently the Extreme Ghostbusters had their own trap. It was a big, dumb, circular one. I always liked the movie one. I always liked the movie one. This one kind of bugged me in some ways. Kind of lazy just having it be a circle. And in some ways, it's actually more difficult to draw because it's a circle. I don't know why they do that. It's probably just to sell a toy. This is probably, actually, this is probably their reasoning for all of it. Anyways, this is my story. My moral fable. Actually, you, you may have heard this in the past. Let's see if I can remember it correctly. A father and son were going to town. This is obviously a very farmer story, as you'll soon learn. Uh, we're going to town to buy a mule because they needed a mule because they needed to, you know, pack things and be able to haul plow and things like that. So they bought one and were returning home. And they, were, they had walked into town on foot because this is in ye olden times. No, no, don't get distracted. I almost went into a double trouble about the etymology of the word ye and how it's not ye, actually ye. Just forget about that. So they were returning home. And what the hell? Oh yeah, I'm I'm, I'm starting the color zone here. By the way, they were returning home with their mule, and on the way back to their house, they were all walking side by side. You know, the man, the son, and the mule. And uh, someone drove by in one of their brand new Model Ts or whatever it was, and leaned out the side of the door and said, "What fools! You know, they're they have a mule right there, and not a single one of them is riding it." And, you know, it's just, they're wasting their own energy. So, uh, the son decided, well, I'll get up on the mule. And they kept on, and then someone else passed them, and they said, look at those, few, uh, look, look at that old man, you know, or, no, excuse me, look at that son, uh, not letting the, his elderly father ride on the mule. Whereas he's, you know, this lazily riding on top of it, blah, blah, blah. And so the son, well, said, well, uh, Paul, or whatever the hell he called him, 
uh, why don't you get up on the mule? So they traded places. Uh, the, the father got up on the mule and rolled the mule back to town, and then they encountered some more people. And those people said, look at that lazy old man making his son walk when they could both be riding. So they said, well, let's both ride the mule. And so they both started riding the mule back to their home. And then more people came along and said, look at that poor animal. Those, <laughs> that man and that son are riding that poor beast of burden back to their home. What a poor, miserable animal. So the father and son got off and said, well, what, what do we do? And they decided, you know what, let's carry the mule back home. So they picked up the mule onto their shoulders and began carrying it back. And on the way, they came to a bridge and tumbled off and fell into the water and all three drowned and died. The moral of the lesson is you can't please everyone because everyone always has some dumbass comment to make about everything. You can't please everyone. Don't worry about it. Do your own thing. Don't worry about how you're going back home with your mule. That's my farmer story. And it's probably something you've heard before, and I'm sure that there's going to be lots of people in the comment section citing various sources. No, that's the wrong story, Blake. Shut up. Because you're, you're, that's the moral of the story. No, you're doing it wrong. Well, excuse me, I'll carry the mule on my back. Fuck you. Anyways, back to Kylie's boobs. Uh, right here, I've actually completed all the, uh, color zoning, which is a big pain in the ass. It, it, in some ways, it's really easy, but it's very, very time-consuming. Especially if you have done something like equipment. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to obscure her backpack. I actually thought about not including it all. Because there's going to be a bunch of mechanisms, and if you Google Extreme Ghostbusters, you know, Proton Pack, then that thing is just the biggest pile of garbage I've ever seen in my life. There's so many, like, knobs and just little glowy bits and stuff all over the thing. Because it's a toy. It was made to be a toy. I feel really bad for whoever had to animate all that. It's just a big, it's a big mess. Uh, so I really wanted to make sure that I obscured most of it. So that I could just draw some basic shapes and say, it's done. It's done. Because obviously the thing that I was more concerned about is dr uh, drawing Kylie appropriately. Uh, by the way, you'll sort of notice, if you kind of zoom in, I guess, that on a lot of the kind of shading lines, the darker areas, as I'm working in binary here. I do little bitty jagged edges, little tiny strokes along the edges. That's in kind of an old inker trick, I guess, whenever you had to work primarily only in inks. And it sort of denotes uh, a fading between light and dark. Whenever you're working only, it's it's, it's kind of the same thing as uh, cross-hatching, except you're just, just loosely doing it, and it's not really quite as committal as it normally would be. And sometimes it looks good, sometimes it doesn't. It looks a bit more natural whenever you're doing certain kinds of styles versus other ones. As far as these sort of uh, cell, cell shading animation look goes, it works alright. It, it, it's okay. That's the one trick that you can employ if you're trying to work only, you know, exclusively in binaries. And, uh, as I've I said in the, uh, the live com, how I'm actually doing this is... I am setting a binary layer up and then going in and doing all of the shading. And then once I'm finally done with the shading, I will merge it down into a normal layer, turn the opacity preservation option on, and then go back over it with whatever color it actually needs to be. And here with the, uh, the hair, I'm kind of doing the shading a little bit differently. I kind of picked up this trick from Gargoyles. There's, one, uh, there's a character in that show called Demona. And her shading kind of works like this as well. She has red hair. And that sort of internal... I don't even know how to describe it. There's probably a word for it. But it's a, it's a, it's a subtracted profile. that like It takes the basic shape of her hair and just minimizes it, shrinks it down. And the inside is complete black and the outside is like total red. Bright red. And I kind of did the same thing with uh, uh, Kylie here. I kind of like the idea of doing it. It's a pretty good solution. Rather than having to uh, go in and... Uh, Tried to shade every individual strand. Looks pretty neat. I should draw Demona sometime. Yeah, I should draw Demona. They're getting a new movie, I think, actually. It's supposed to be like a 2017, 2018 film, I think. But that's coming up. I can't believe, actually, I told Wooly about it, and he never actually brought it up in the podcast. I don't think that he would be excited about it. Oh, well. I guess I just care more about it than he does. I guess I just care more about it. Uh, but as you notice, I'm, I'm putting all the shading for the equipment to one layer. 
but I am individually going in to each color zoned area, like the the uh, equip gray, equip blue, equip red, those layers, and going in individually selecting those so that I can uh, control where it is exactly that I'm painting inside of it as accurately as possible. Of course, you don't have to do this, but to me, it's it's a bit faster for me. For you, it may be a lot faster to just go in and just haphazardly go over the entire layer without actually selecting anything. You know, it's just up to you. There's no right or, right, uh, right or wrong way to do all these things. But keep in mind that the way that you do them is going to affect how the overall image ends up looking at the very end. And again, there is no right or wrong with that. It just does. It's just, this is how things work. Method always affects the final result. Ooh. And I'm kind of getting done on the very final sections of this. The equipment uh, section of the shading takes just a huge amount of time. And it was at this point that I actually started to feel really bad and started to feel kind of ill just because I had been... This takes place over like two days or three days. And because I had a bunch of other stuff going on at the same time. Uh, anytime that you're working, be sure to try to take a break. Is You know, whenever you can. Even though I've done both kinds of work. You know, hard physical labor growing up on a farm, obviously. And I've done this kind of work where it's, you know, just working in a, sort of an, uh, an office setting. And there are two entirely different kinds of work. Don't feel bad if you're working inside versus working outside. Because they're both very difficult in their own ways. And they're both rewarding in their own ways. Working outside with your hands can be... A, it can be satisfying in some way because it's almost kind of mindless in many ways. Because you're so uh, focused on uh, just getting something done. Like inane repetition. Like hammering a nail over and over again. Who cares? You can barely... You barely even have to think about it. Whereas something like this, you are always having to think about what you're doing precisely at all times. So it can be very mentally exhausting. And it can, just it can just absolutely wreck you as far as your health goes, if you're not careful. Especially since you're not moving, you're not doing anything. Like I suffer from like low blood pressure and all sorts of other things. Uh, some of that is related to just genetics and some of that is related to, you know, actually just the way that I work. So whenever you're doing this, also, of course, just be aware of your health and just try to take good care of yourself at the same time. Um, <laughs> as I draw the suggestive slime dripping off, I'm drawing it, 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 this looks really bad because it's so bloody looking. But of course, I'm working in red right now because it's easier to see when I'm, whenever I'm going back over all this green and uh, uh, sort of light blue or low saturation blues and things like that. At this point, I change it back to the bright green that I need it to be in. And I, again, I go back over on another binary layer and keep doing it that way. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into like drawing slime and stuff. It's really not that really important to the overall <laughs> image. Um, I will say, is you'll notice some of the line work. Uh, some of the lines are a bit thicker than others are. Ugh. The longer the limb, the longer the length of the overall line that you need to draw, often it will be a little bit thicker, whereas the tighter the detail, you'll want to go a bit smaller. But at the same time, you need to have you need to have good line variation. But at the same time, you don't need to have so much that say the the eye lashes or something, or like one pixel, whereas the thickness of a line on the length of the leg would be like a 15 or something. Like, that's way too much. So you do need to restrict yourself. Although playing with line thickness and having very thick lines that taper off and do very thin ones can look really nice if you do it just perfectly. But it's very difficult. Another one of those little game things where you can kind of play with it until it works and make it look real nice. Real nice indeed. Uh, we're finishing the, this up with a little bit of uh, lighting. And I kind of do the same thing here, uh, working in binary. Then I go back and individually select each area and change them from white to whatever color I think matches them uh, most well. With her skin, her skin is already so pale that we can keep that as white. With something like the uh, the gold of the equipment, like that blue, since it's sort of implied to be sort of a plastic look, and most of the equipment in general, since that's also supposed to be metal, you can also keep it as being white. As far as the uh, overall uh, palette of this image goes. Um, whereas something with, like, uh, the brown up there on her little shoulder things, or the gold, or the red, that does need to be changed from something, like, down, like, 
to the like the red needs to be sort of more an orange or a purple or something in that range. Uh, and the the gold of the equipment probably more an orange, yellow, red, purple. You know, just whatever works. Uh, I won't go too much in the the idea of how exactly you change all the tonality and everything up as far as the overall composition of the palette goes, but you get the idea. Okay, so we're finally done. We're finally done working on this kindly image. And my voice is just about gone, as expected. <clears throat> I did a little bit of follow-up image as far as just drawing the, uh, the sort of steam coming out of it. I tried to minimize the amount of raster that I used with it, though. I just placed it in the background. And I did a little bit of a uh, binary uh, layer smoke on the top, just to show that off. Okay, but as far as the, the results of all this goes... Looks alright to me. Uh, it's probably not the best binary thing that I've drawn. Actually, I think I like the launch wallpaper that I did the, the best out of all the binary stuff that I've done so far. But this one isn't too bad at all. Uh, for the very first time that I've ever drawn Kylie, I've never attempted to draw her at all, it turned out pretty well, I think. Uh, it, it wasn't completely accurate to the original model, but uh, as I said, I wasn't really going to try to be. But I think overall, it, it does work pretty well. The composition works pretty well. The colors work pretty well. Uh, I did go back over and use my little trick of mul using a single multiply layer with a very uh, bright, I think it was a blue or maybe a green, to give everything sort of a unified tint to it. And that's the reason why the colors changed just a little bit, in case you're wondering about that. Uh, but other than that, I think that's all I changed. So overall, I do like this image. Pretty good. Uh, I don't know why there's so many boxes in this room, but don't worry about it. Stop asking perfectly legitimate questions. So, that's it for now. Uh, let's see. If you have any questions or comments, of course, say those in the uh, comments below. If you have any requests as far as what kind of videos you would like to see in, in regards to just art process in general, uh, be sure to leave those as well. If you have any perverted comments to make about Kylie, please keep those to yourself. Again, <laughs> with these videos, if you want to... Don't start like, posting comments like, this is my favorite pornography, let's all go here and look, then I'm gonna start deleting shit like that, because, you know, it's just an art video, guys. I know it is related to Zone, but please restrain yourselves. There's Picardo for that, Picardo.tv. If you want to go see a Zone stream, you can check him out there. Uh, Picardo.tv, like, slash live slash channel dot php watch... I don't know, Zone stream, just search for Zone on Picardo, I guess. I'm sure that he'll appreciate it. He'll, he'll, he'll love to talk to you. Okay, but that's it for now. I hope you enjoy this, and I look forward to making you feel uncomfortable about various things in the future. So long, so long, world, so long.